All right, uh, let's start with actually repeating what we did at the end of the previous class, okay? So go ahead and op open up Jump. And I believe in the previous class, we looked at the data set called Universal Bank CT, correct? Yeah, it should be uh, in your list of files that you recently opened, right? So just double click on it and it will open up like that. So reminder, here's what this data set uh, is all about. Uh, a bank, uh, Leaves makes living by uh, loaning uh, or uh, giving money, right, as the commercial loan or as a mortgage loan or any kind of loan, right, uh, to customers. It can be people or companies. So uh, in one column, uh, where is that, the personal loan, uh, we have information uh, about whether or not that specific customer accepted the loan or, or not, right? So if you click on that or position the mouse over that, did she or he accept the offer of a personal loan? So bank approaches the customer and says, hey, do you want a loan? We have low interest rates today, right? <laughs> so get approved today. And the customer decides whether or not to accept that offer, okay? Um, and that's uh, every, every customer, we have 5,000 of them, right? We record a lot of additional information or predictors, right, about that specific customer including age, experience, income, family size, average balance on the credit card per month, education level, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So some of the variables are uh, categorical, some of the predictors are categorical, right? Such as, for example, zip code. No, we excluded zip code, right? So we'll strike that. Education is a categorical variable, right? And you can see that I have three levels, three categories, right, for that variable. Undergrad, grad, and advanced, okay? The other predictors are continuous. And I still want to be able to build a model that for any incoming customer will make uh, a classification, right? Will that customer likely accept the loan if I offer that customer loan? Or will that customer likely reject the loan, okay? So actually, you know what? Uh, let's update our decision uh, or tools matrix, right? Remember I gave you this handout some time ago, probably, you will have it right somewhere. Okay, so this, I told you, is going to be our roadmap, right? Roadmap to happiness, so to speak. So all the tools that we're going to discuss during this class, this semester, we're going to put uh, somewhere on that map, okay? So right now we're discussing supervised learning algorithms. Supervised means that I have a target variable, right? So there is one attribute in my data file, it's a column, right? That I'm trying to predict, or I'm trying to classify, right? And the data really uh, that I have, I'm using to, to build that model, okay? And we uh, we started with the model, what was the model that we con that considered first? I believe, like we started with this weird example with stick figures, right? Whether or not they will default on the loan based on the body shape, body color, head shape, etc. And then uh, we did, uh, in, we considered in, in class the Titanic example, right? Yeah. Will we be able to predict who of the passengers of Titanic will drown and who will survive based on three categorical variables, right? Gender, class that they traveled, and age, adult versus a child, right? And we said that our target is categorical variable and our predictors are categorical variables in those examples, right? So therefore, uh, that is a classification tree. Well, guess what? Uh, in this example that we're about to, uh, well, we discussed that we're going to do it again, right? Uh, we're about to look at, uh, we have a mixture, right? Our, uh, our target, the personal loan, is still a categorical variable, right? So yes, no, whether or not they accept the loan or not. And our predictors, most of them actually are continuous, right? There is one predictor which is categorical, that's education, but most of them are continuous. So, and it's still going to be a classification tree. So if your uh, target is categorical and your predictors are continuous, we still have classification tree. Classification tree, as one of the models anyway, right? It's kind of small, so let me make it bigger. So, okay, classification tree. And what we did was, uh, let's go back to the file, right? So I want, I want to show you, uh, 
I want to show you a cool trick. So let's go ahead and build the model. But before we build the model, remember we discussed that there are uh, generally three data sets that we create out, out of our set, right? So here they are. This is my original data set, right? Data set. I said that you can get out of your data set a smaller set, which we call training, right? And training is used to do what? Training set we're using <coughs> to create our model, right? To train it. So this decision tree that we're about to build, that's what we're going to be using. But the danger is that we're overfitting the model, right? We're getting, if the model is becoming too detailed, and I'm, I'm, I keep splitting the leaves, right? I'm getting smaller and smaller subsets, and eventually sometimes I can drill down to the level of single observation, which obviously is going to be a pure set, right? It's either yes or no. There is nothing else, right? So I'm, I'm going to uh, do too good of a job building a model, okay? And that results in overfitting. So to avoid overfitting, I'm going to use validation set. Validation set. In order to cut the model down, right? So training set is used to build a fully blown model, as large as we can get out of that, right? And later we can, we're going to say, no, wait a minute. What happens in actuality is I'm overfitting because my uh, errors are getting high, okay? Or the model doesn't, doesn't improve the accuracy, maybe. I keep splitting. I'm getting better and better results on the training sets, but validation set doesn't show any improvement. So I may decide, you know, I'm going to stop splitting because it doesn't create any new information for me, okay? So this is a uh, used training set is used to be, uh, build a model, right? Build a model, build a tree. This is used to prune a tree, prune it back, right? Cut the branches and leaves out of the tree that do not contribute to more accuracy, right? And finally, when I use training and validation set to construct my model, I can use testing set, testing set, in order to say, yep, these two uh, sets I used to build the model, now let's apply to the set that was not seen by the model before completely, as if it's like, it's a ready to go model, right? Now I want to see how it performs on the data that was not used to either uh, build a tree, grow a tree, or, or cut it down, right? Um, okay, so sometimes training set is also called holdout set. No, no, hold on, that's not training set, that's validation. Uh, sometimes also it's called holdout set. We're kind of setting it aside for later, right? Or after we build a tree and now we have to cut it back, okay? All right, so uh, let's quickly reproduce the uh, results that we, we saw before. So I'm going to go to analyze, create, create the sets first, right? So predictive modeling, uh, make validation column. And here I'm gonna say 75%, yeah, I'm gonna leave the default settings, right? I'm going to say 75% is going to be used for building a model and validation set is going to be 25% and let's use a different seed, right? But same for everybody, like 50, for example. Can be any number, really, okay? <coughs> this way, we're going to generate the same breakdown between training and validation subsets, okay? And then I click on the button that says fixed random. Click. And you can see that that created an additional column for me, right? Some records are labeled training, some records are labeled validation. Okay, cool. And now, <coughs> building the model, go to analyze, predictive modeling, partition, because also it's called recursive partitioning, right? Ah, huh? and? 75 versus 25, and the seed that I used was 50. Okay, Fixed random, okay? Yep, so partition, and here, I have to say that my personal loan column is the target. Everything else except validation column is my predictors, right? Set of predictors. And also validation, I have to drag into the validation right here. And that's it. Now I'm ready to go. When I click OK, see the reason why I'm doing that partly is because I don't want to overgrow a tree to avoid overfitting, right? And another thing is, uh, this splitting allows for me to click on the go button and it will split the tree completely, okay? 
So, uh, that's something actually that we discussed at the end of the previous class, right? Uh, it says that right now, I'm, uh, I'm running uh, the tree that has 15 splits altogether, okay? All right, and right here, vertical line on the split history shows me, you get the split history as well, right? Yeah. By default, good. Uh, split history shows me that, yes, it, uh, uh, it has 15 splits as the optimal data set, right? Uh, as the optimal uh, tree size. And uh, you can see that what happened is uh, R squared, R squared is another measure, okay? It's one of the most popular measures of the goodness of fit. How nicely your model fits your data. Because at that stage, that's, that's, that's the only thing that matters, right? How closely I can build a model that follows my data, okay? So one of the most popular R squared that, that are used in statistics and in data analytics is R squared, okay? R squared, here's the general uh, interpretation of the R squared, okay? Let me write it out, okay? R squared, R squared gives you, gives percentage of data, percentage of, um, not, not the data, hold on, percentage of variability, variability of uh, target variable, target variable, explained, explained by variability variability in predictors or predictor variables it sounds obscure right percentage of variability explained by the variability in predictor variables what does that mean well <clears throat> when i'm building a tree what i want to do essentially is um, follow as closely to the data, right? And uh, my target variable, well, the reason why it's called variable is because it varies from one observation to another observation, right? Specifically, in my example, the target variable is did the customers get a loan or did they reject a loan from me, right? So there is variability. From customer to customer, the answer is different, okay? Why customers are different from each other? Why the result is different? Well, I hope that the results are different because of that. Because every customer has different level of income, different level of education, right? Different uh, balance on the credit card. Uh, whether or not they hold the mortgage with that bank differs for each person, right? So all these financial and demographic things about the customer, they contribute to the fact that some customers get a loan and some customers don't get a loan, right? By the way, while we're on the subject, uh, on the top of the tree, typically you see the variable which is most predictive, right? Which has highest predictive power. In other words, that's the main variable, right? So what do we see? Whether or not customers will get a loan depends primarily on what? Income. On income, which makes sense, right? If people have low income, they probably can't afford the loan, right? And if people have high income, that's, that's when you start getting loans and mortgages and whatnot, right? So that makes sense from that standpoint, right? And then after that, it splits on education, on income again, family size, you can see that, right? Okay, so R squared. R squared basically tells me that uh, here, right? I'm, I'm looking at the R squared at that point, okay? And I'm going to guesstimate. Yeah, it's probably something like 90, 0.9, right? It tells me that 90% of the variability from customer to customer in terms of whether or not they're getting a loan is explained by the fact that different customers have different education level, different income level, different credit card balance levels, etc., etc., okay? So, uh, in the world of uh, business analytics, data analytics, the higher the R squared, the better, okay? That means that your independent variables explain high percentage of your target variable, okay? Another way around, if your R squared is close to zero, that means that there is variability that happens in the data, right? But it's almost not explained by your predictors. That's a bad model, essentially, okay? So the higher, the better. But again, remember we discussed that with misclassification, we said the lowest, the better, right? Yeah, but is there a borderline between good models and bad models? Is there like a magical number? 
if if the misclassification rate is below that, I can say, yeah, model is good. If it's above, no, model is not good. Unfortunately, no such thing, right? The lower, the better. But after that, we have no guidelines. Same thing with R squared. Okay, we can say that if it's above 0.7, then it's an accurate model because 70% of the target variable is explained by predictor variables. Unfortunately, no, can't do that. But 90% is very decent, right? 90% <clears throat> means that about 10% of what happens with my customers in terms of loans is not explained by these variables. That's something else. Okay, can be a random factor, completely random. Or can be variables that we're not capturing, right, in this data set. And these variables that I have explain 90%. So you can see that uh, what happens with my data set, a blue, blue line is, uh, yeah, it says validation data is in red, which means blue is training, right? You can see that the higher the number of splits, what happens with my R squared is getting higher and higher and higher. And actually, even after 15 splits, it keeps improving, right? So I'm splitting tree more and more, right? I'm adding more leaves to the tree. The accuracy of the tree, the predictive power, the goodness of it keeps improving, right? But what happens to the red one? Red one is validation. Right? We're saying, let's use a separate holdout set in order to see how it classifies these observations. We know the answers, right? Yes, no for each person, uh, whether or not they got along. We know the answers. It's part of our data. So we're going to see just how closely we're following the actual answers. And the, uh, you can see that kind of the performance starts to deteriorate, right? So what Jump does essentially is it keeps splitting for 10 more sets, right? So your, on your validation set, on your validation set, when R squared peaks, just what happened right here, after that, Jump goes for 10 more steps, 10 more splits, and says, did R squared improve? If not, then we're going to stop and cut back. Okay, these 10 last steps. And that's what happened, right? It keeps splitting for 10 more steps. The R squared doesn't improve. In fact, it goes down. The jump says, well, there was no improvement, which means that we're overfitting, really. We're on the overfitting zone. So let's cut it down to only 15, and that's our best tree. So essentially, what I'm saying here is uh, you are better off... Uh, your model is good when you're capturing essential relationships between target and predictors and avoid, uh, avoid modeling the noise, right? That's what overfitting is all about, modeling the noise. So you build the model good enough to predict the main features, main knowledge in your data, main patterns, right? And after that, you're starting to quite literally split the hairs, right? Predicting like, you know, these teeny tiny minute variations that are specific to your data set. That's something that you want to avoid, okay? Now, uh, let me show you one amazing thing, okay? Uh, well, let, let's first of all show, display the classification matrix, otherwise known as confusion matrix, right? So let's go ahead and say in the red, red, ah, red triangle, uh, show feed details, right? Okay, so here is my confusion matrix. And there are actually two confusion matrices, right? Which makes sense, right? Because I have two sets, right? Training set, it does misclassify some of the observations, right? And then there is a validation set. So you can see that uh, over here, for example, do you have the same confusion matrix as me? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so confusion matrix, right? Uh, 20, 21 versus 29 right there. Okay. Uh, it's a little weird because yesterday when I was running this example, it was slightly different. Okay. Anyhow. Um, so uh, I'm looking at the misclassification rate, and misclassification rate is very small, right? Uh, on the uh, training set, I misclassify only about 1.3% of all the data, right? Which is very decent, right? Very decent performance. And on the validation set, close to that, 1.28%. But here is the deal, ladies and gentlemen. Let me ask you this question. Uh, the two types of errors that I'm making are false positive and false negative, right? So here I have 21 observations that are false positive, right? I classify them, predict them as yes, they will get a loan, but in actuality they are no, right? In actuality, they will not get a loan. These are false negatives, right? I classify them as no, they will not get a loan, when in actuality they will get a loan. Question for you, ladies and gentlemen. From the bank standpoint, 
Are they the same or one is worse than another? What's worse? To miss a person, mispredict that the person will get a loan or mispredict that the person will not get a loan? From the bank standpoint. How a bank makes money? If you're getting a loan from them, right? So therefore, it's important for them that people who will get a loan, we will classify them as the ones that who will get a loan, right? But what happens if we classify them, so these people, right? 29 people right here, okay? We predicted that they will not get a loan, right? Predicted is no, but in actuality is yes. That's bad, that's missed opportunity, right? They would have gotten a loan from us if offered, but we classified them as no, so we didn't even bother. So we're losing an opportunity, right? What, what's bad about these people? We said that they will get a loan, but in actuality, no. What's the cost of that decision? I decide to contact these people and tell them, do you want a loan? And they say no. What's the cost? How much does it cost the company to do that? A phone call, right? Or a brochure that they put in the mail, less than a dollar, right? So the cost of these decisions is much smaller than this cost, because these are the people who would have gotten a loan, therefore we would you know, give them money and charge the interest rate, that contributes to the profit of the bank, right? So false positive and false negative are not exactly the same in this example. Remember the one that we did before, misclassification of uh, uh, classification of people who will survive the Titanic or not survive the Titanic. Either way, the outcome is fixed, right? So yeah, it's a good model, it's a bad model. We have a lot of false negative, false positives. Who cares at that point? It happened, right, already hundred something years ago, okay? In this case, yes is more expensive than no, right? If you're missing the yes, the person who will get a loan, you're missing on the business opportunity. The bank loses profit, right? So therefore, what I want to do probably is to, uh, one way how I can avoid that is lower the, or, or uh, increase the cutoff point. What's the cutoff point for the decision, yes or no? Remember, discuss that. Uh-huh. 0.5, right? So if if uh, we have a if we have a uh, a node right that has a mixture of yeses and noes, we use the highest probability, right? And the cutoff is 0.5. If the probability is above 0.5, that's how we're going to classify that specific node. Okay. So what happens if I lower the cutoff from 0.5 to let's say 0.25? That means that uh, I will classify more observations as yeses, right? Because, you know, previously, for example, let's say uh, an observation was 0.4, okay? I would have classified that as a no before, right? But now uh, that I, I lowered the, 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 the cutoff uh, to 0.5, now it becomes a yes, right? So I move some of the previously classified points to a different category, okay? And let's see what happens, actually. You know what, we're in the unexplored territory. You and I don't know what will happen. So hopefully I will get more observations classified as yes, correctly, okay? So here's how we do it. Go to the uh, red triangle. Everything is in the red triangle, right, maybe? My God. And go to this option that we never used before, specify profit matrix. Click. Okay. <clears throat> do you see that one? For the target, yes. The probability threshold right now is 0.5. If it's above 0.5, then I say it's yes. If it's below 0.5, then I say it's no, okay? Now I'm going to lower that 0.25, okay? And go ahead and click on the set, set button, and then after that, click OK. Look what happened, okay? That was my original confusion matrix, right? I classified 29. Now, look at that. Actually, the, the, this number is fixed. This number is constant. 29... Uh, versus 339, these are all the people who actually accepted the loan, right? It's either I'm classifying them right or wrong, right? So 339 plus 29 gives me how much? 268, right? Total number of people who said yes is 268. Uh, and before that, when I, when I use the cutoff, this is the confusion matrix for the cutoff point of 0 0.5, right? I was misclassifying 29 of these people. It would have been yeses, I said that there are no's, okay? Now that I lowered my cutoff point, look what happens. Still same total, right? 368 observations, right? Still same training set, same validation set, still same 300 and 
68 observations. But now, instead of missing 29 of them, I'm missing only 19. Because I lowered the cutoff, right? Some of the people who I classified as no became yeses now, right? So I improved my prediction, right? Uh, now, on, on, the, on the other side of the house, of course, what would happen is a lot of people who would have been classified as a no, right? Now I'm classifying them as yes. So I'm getting worse on this end of the spectrum, right? But that's not a big deal, right, for me, because, yeah, so these are the people who will not get a loan, and I'm saying that I should contact and offer them a loan. The cost of this decision is not very high, right? So, yeah, I send them the... Yeah, let me not take this call. All right. So, uh, and, and overall, uh, by the way, what, what happens to the misclassification rate? No, it's actually went up, right? Misclassification rate was what on the training set? That was before I changed my uh, my cutoff point, right? It was uh, 1.33, right? When I decreased my when I decreased my cutoff value, uh, the misclassification rate instead of 1.3, it became it became 5.2, right? And same thing happened with validation, correct? Misclassification rate was 1.28, and now it became, where was that? Yeah, 1.76, right? So I lowered my cutoff point, okay? That resulted in the worst performance of the model overall, but I did it for a good reason, right? Now I'm capturing more of these important, this is my important category, right? People who would have said yes to the loan, right? I'm doing actually a better job predicting that important category, okay? so. This type of uh, uh, analysis actually is, is good when your categories, yes or no, they're not the same. If the cost of misclassifying yes and saying it's a no is much higher than the cost of misclassifying a no and saying it's going to be a yes. Okay? Now let's see just for the heck of it. Right? What would have happened if uh, I would raise my uh, cutoff from 0.5 to let's say 0.75? What would be your prediction? What would happen to the misclassification rate? No, it actually would also go up, misclassification rate. But this time around, I'm going to be filtering out a lot of yeses and classify them as noes, right? So I'm going to be actually worsening my performance, right? Let's, let's do that. Let's go ahead and do that, just for the heck of it. So I go to the partition. Again, say, uh, specify uh, matrix, right? So now it's 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and I'm going to raise it to 0.75. Set, set, and click OK, and it will create another decision matrix for me. Now look what happened. You see, you see that uh, first of all, my misclassification rate again. Before I started, uh, you know, tweaking these things around, it was 1.3, right? Now it's 0.2, and from 1.28 on the validation set, it went up to 1.68. So either way, you move your cutoff, <coughs> you lower it, you make it higher. Overall, misclassification rate is getting higher, right? So that's, that's one thing. And second, this is actually a worse situation for me because previously I was misclassified 29 yeses as noes, right? Now I'm misclassifying 76 yeses as noes. So that's a worse situation for me, right? I'm missing on a lot of people who would, who would have taken the loan, and now I'm classifying them as non-takers, right? So, therefore, if you want to improve the sensitivity of your model towards just one class, right, towards the class of yes, because it's most important for me to capture the yeses correctly, right, you probably want to lower your cutoff from 0.5 to a lower value, okay? Make sense? Any questions? You're awfully quiet. Say meow. Meow. Wow. Okay. Well, we have about 10 minutes, so let's start a new topic. That would be regression tree, okay? Now, regression trees, I got to tell you, they are very similar to classification trees. Let's go back to, the, to this matrix, right? <laughs> but instead of my categorical predicted uh, uh, target variable, I'm sorry, categorical target variable, I'm predicting a continuous target variable, okay? And my predictors, again, can be either categorical or continuous, 
Okay, so one model that I can use here when my target is continuous is regression tree. Regression tree. And same thing here, right? I'm going to make it bigger. Hold on. I'm going to make it bigger to 10, for example. Regression tree. And same thing here. Regression tree. Okay. Make it 10. All right. So, in other words, if what I'm trying to do is not a yes, no, true, false, male, female, survive versus drown kind of thing, but actually a number. Okay? And uh, let's take a look at the example. So, let's switch back to jump and close that file. Okay? We're looking at the file on universal main customers, right? So go ahead and close that one and go to help uh, sample data library, just like that. Okay? And in the list of files, you should be able to find files about diamonds. Oh no, where are the diamonds? Diamonds. Do you see? That? Yeah, diamonds data. Yeah, it should be diamonds data. Go ahead and open it up. So, this is the data set that contains information about 2690 diamonds. Anybody here bought a diamond ring before? Me neither. So, uh, but what do we know about diamonds? Expensive. They're expensive. And they're probably the dumbest thing that you can buy, right? In life. Because two things. Easiest thing in the world to buy it. Hardest thing in the world to sell it. Right? If you buy the diamond ring, great. How, how much is the diamond ring? What are the ranges of prices? Enormous, right? In, in thousands of dollars, okay? So if you buy diamond ring for the wedding or whatever it is, right? You pay six grand. Later, you decide that you don't want it. Oh, well, yeah. Sorry. Try, try selling it. Almost impossible, right? At least that's what I hear. I mean, I would know from my own experience, but that's what I hear, okay? And uh, here is the uh, information about 26, almost 2,700 diamonds, right? Carat weight, that's basically how heavy is the stone, right? Depth, apparently they can measure the depth. So whatever this number is, I don't know what it means, but it's continuous, right? Table. Jesus, I don't even know what a table. No idea what that means, right? And of course, price. Now, price is measured in terms of dollars, right? So these are cheap stones right there, thousand, right? And I'm sure we have more expensive stones down there, okay? At the same time, about each diamond we have color, right? which is coded apparently, right? So, how is it coded? Uh, we don't know. Clarity, VVS1, VS2, have no idea what that means. Apparently it's meaningful for people who deal with diamonds, right? And then there is cut. Cut can be excellent, good, very good, and ideal, look at that. I'm wondering if there is a bad cut. We're selling bad diamond, right? Badly cut. How would you know? That it, and then the report, whatever that means, right? Report. So can you guess what I'm trying to predict here? If this is my data set, what I'm trying to predict, which one of these columns is the potential candidate to be the target? If you would have to guess, what would that be? Cut? Based on weight and the price? I think you can cut... In, in any way, right? Any, any diamond can be cut pretty much in any way. So what do you think would be the, the target variable here? Uh, F is the best. Which one? F. It says it's flawless. I just went to Oh, flawless. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, I would say that the best candidate for the target variable would be price. Because price depends on the weight, obviously, right? And can you guess how it depends on the weight? The heavier the diamond is, the more expensive, the more expensive it is, right? It's probably the strongest predictor, right? The how, how big is the diamond? That is the biggest effect on the price, right? Other things uh, matter as well, right? Obviously, but not quite uh, as, as, as hugely as, as the weight, right? I'm guessing the... Clarity is, uh, matters, right? The cut matters. Other things that like color may matter, right? 
I don't know, some, you know, rubies are less expensive than whatever the hell else is out there, I, I don't know. But I would say that out of these columns, out of these variables, what I'm trying to predict is the price. And remember, we just discussed that, right? So here, I'm trying to build a supervised data model, meaning that there is a target variable that I'm trying to predict, right? And that target is continuous. So in my specific case, I'm trying to predict the price based on everything else, right? And essentially, I'm going to do exactly the same thing, okay? Step one, I'm going to build a tree, right? So essentially, what I'm going to do is have a tree-like structure which branches out, right? And eventually, I arrive to this final node or leaf, right? That tells me for all diamonds that satisfy all these categories and rules that I have in place, right? That's how much the price is going to be, okay? So let's go ahead and first create training set and validation set because I don't want to be clicking this thing, right? A lot. So analyze, predictive modeling, make validation column, okay? And let's say just for the heck of it so that you don't think that 75 versus 25 is, that's how it's supposed to be all the time. Let's do 0.6 versus 0.4. How about that? And again, let's split that so that my tree is the same as your tree, right? So let's use the random seed of 100, for example. 60, 40, right? 60% 60 of my points will be training set, 40% validation, seed 100. So I click OK. Here is my validation column. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing as I did before. Nothing, nothing is different, okay? Uh, let's go to Analyze, Predictive Modeling, Partition. So what I want to do is build a tree. Again, right? My target is going to be price, right? So I'm going to drag the price in this field. Carrot weight all the way down to the report is going to be my predictors. And validation, I have to place in the validation column. Okay? The jump is easy because you're not required to write any single piece of, of coding, right? It's a point and click environment. That's what the beauty, the, the beauty of it. Okay? And I click OK. There it is. So I click on the Go button. And then it just keeps splitting, right? The tree for me. How many splits do you have? A hundred. Everybody, right? We use the same training versus validation partitioning, right? We have same sets. We're going to build the same tree. Wow, that's a big tree, right? Is that a good, an accurate tree, by the way? I'd say yes, because look at the R squared. Remember we discussed that today. R squared is one of the most popular measure, right? And R squared in this case actually is much more interpretable because, you know, before that, when I, when I was classifying people as, yes, they will borrow the money versus no, I will not borrow the money. How do you define the variability? Here I can define variability very easily, right? Because the prices are dollars and cents and my predictions are in dollars and cents, right? So I can define how far my predicted price from the actual price and from that I can compute how variable are my uh, uh, how far my model is from uh, from the data, right? So, but the same interpretation, right? Remember, R squared tells you what percentage of data. Uh, 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 strike that. What percentage of your target variable, dependent variable, variability in the target variable is explained by the variability in your predictors, right? So here, I'm looking at this uh, R squared, right? Do I have? Yeah, right here, right? On my training set, the R squared was 0.96. In the world of data analytics and statistics, this is huge, okay? Almost 100%. This model is very accurate, okay? So, in other words, uh, what I'm saying is 96.2% of the variability in price of diamonds from one diamond to another is going to be different, right? Is because different diamonds have variability in terms of weight, carrot weight, in terms of cut, clarity, and all these other things that we have no idea about, right? So, different characteristics of the diamonds, they contribute to the fact that they have different prices. And our model that we built accounts for 96% of that. PDG. Pretty darn good. Okay? So, but this is a huge tree, right? But that's essentially what uh, 
uh, what uh, regression trees are all about. Okay, same idea as classification tree. The only thing is you are not predicting the class. Yes, no, survived versus drowned, took the loan versus not, uh, did not take the loan, defaulted on the loan versus did not default on the loan. You are predicting the actual dollar value. Okay, your target is continuous, numerical, not the categorical. Okay, but it's the same idea. All right. Okay, we're done with this material. Next class is uh, exam. The study guide is posted. Bring the scantron, bring the pencil, and bring knowledge with you. Okay?